In this video, we will continue on our little series looking at designing steel members in pure compression. Um, and what we're going to talk about is go into a little bit of a, a deep dive on restraint. So, uh, as we've discussed already, that you know the buckling capacity of an element is really determined, um, you know, based upon its length between points of uh, of effective restraint. And so. You know, that um, uh, the closer the restraints are together, the shorter the effective length, the higher the buckling capacity. Um, so, you know, let's just have a, a quick, you know, refresh looking at, you know, from Euler buckling. If we have uh, our true pin-pin column here, uh, you know, our critical buckling load is going to just be pi squared EI over L squared. Um, but, you know, because the restraints here are, you know, just top and bottom. But say that we add some restraints in... Uh, right at mid height. Well, that uh, cuts our effective length in half and essentially uh, quadruples the uh, buckling load, which uh, this, um, you know, this little column, this compression member, uh, can take before buckling. So that's a, you know, it's, we, you know, we would like to be able to take advantage of these restraints uh, where we can. Um, and then, you know, before we we move on too much further. Just another sort of quick note is that um, you know restraints aren't necessarily the same about both axes. So if we look at the example that we have here, you know we could perhaps have uh, you know buckling uh, of some distance with an unrestrained length uh, of L for say the strong axis of a uh, an I section, and we might have a restraint at the mid height of a uh, of an, that same I section, uh, but about the weak axis, so that we can kind of balance out uh, the critical bucking loads of, of each. And so it is just really, you know, I just want to take this brief pause um, to you know, state that, you know, it is important that you check uh, the slenderness limit, uh, which is really dependent upon the effective length and the uh, radius of gyration uh, for both limits because it's this LE uh, might change about two different directions. All right, so you know that's a, that should be all more or less review. Uh, now going into the you know minimum you know restraint requirements. So if we if we want to put these restraints in here, you know they need to have some minimum strength and minimum stiffness, and and this should make some intuitive sense. So if this was a steel column and we were trying to restrain it from buckling, well, you know, a piece of chewing gum uh, isn't going to be strong enough. Uh, you know, a rubber band uh, is not going to be stiff enough. And, you know, you'd see if that column wants to buckle, it'll just take it along uh, with it. So uh, as designers, we need to know, well, if we're going to, you know, put some restraints in here, um, you know, what do we need to do? What, what sort of size should we put in? Uh, does it have to be the same size as the column? Can it be smaller? Does it have to be bigger? Uh, what, what do we do? Well, they're all really dictated uh, by uh, you know, a stiffness. And it's the stiffness is uh, what's alpha m equals 16 pi ei over l cubed. So, you know, I've got a, a, a little two little diagrams here uh, which are talking about this alpha. So this alpha, think about this as the stiffness of the restraint. So, you know, if we're looking back up to our um, our example up at the top here, uh, the alpha would be the stiffness of the restraint here. And you see as this buckles, well, that's going to, uh, to generate, you know, a little bit of a force. Uh, you know, as the spring's trying to pull back, it'll generate some force. Um, some alpha, again, this is a stiffness, uh, times, uh, you know, whatever we move across this delta, so that would be alpha times delta, and um, of course that'll generate, you know, uh, sort of equal and opposite forces, alpha delta over 2, alpha delta over 2. And, and, you know, we would we'd get some buckled shape which looks like this, which is, uh, you know, what they call this, it's a first mode buckled shape, so if this is our, our first mode here and this is our second mode, so thinking of the mode, just, you know, number of half sine waves that you have, uh, this is somewhere in between, and that's what would happen 
you know, if we have this um, alpha, the, the stiffness of our restraint is less than this uh, alpha M. Uh, well, you can just put that alpha M into a, a little box for us. And we can uh, we'll box this guy up as well. Now, what we've drawn over here on the right is, uh, you know, kind of what we have drawn up here in this little figure is that, you know, the stiffness of our restraint alpha is greater than this alpha M of 16 pi EI over L cubed. And so if that's going to happen, then that restraint is going to be effective um, in stopping this uh, column from, from moving out. And really, in order to be effective, we want this delta that we're moving to be uh, as close to zero as possible. So, you know, th that's, that's a nice sort of uh, theory on how do we get there, but you know, what do we do in practice? Well, in practice, what we find is that, um, I'll just cover that up a little bit so that you don't get to see everything all at once. Um, <laughs> uh, in practice, you know, trying to find this stiffness, this alpha M here, you know, trying to find this can actually be quite difficult because, well, it's L, but that's probably an L for a, a true pin. And, you know, just like, you know, how we, we came up with a um, critical buckling load here, but that was all based off of some uh, idealizations and uh, some simplifications. And, you know, this is sort of similarly derived. And so to find a, a true stiffness with real elements uh, can be quite complicated, you know, given the uh, initial out of straightness of these elements or the, um, you know, the, the end conditions, so the, the level of fixity at both of them. So this can be, you know, a fairly complicated uh, analysis. And, you know, as designers, because we're constantly iterating through our design, we don't want complicated, we want something simple. And so... Uh, that's what the steel standard NZS 3404 has done, is that instead of looking for a stiffness, uh, what you do is you check your strength. And so, you know, what a restraint has to be able to do is be able to resist 2.5% of the applied load N star. So, you know, here I've got N CR, but, you know, you have N star here. Uh, so same thing. So the the uh, your compression demand and you know it has to be able to resist that in both tension and compression, and it needs to be effectively anchored, um, you know, somewhere off uh, away from the column. And if you can meet the strength requirement, um, then sort of the geometry is such that you uh, you automatically meet uh, the stiffness requirements. And the standard was laid out uh, such where you know, we could probably you know, meet the stiffness requirements with something which didn't have nearly the same amount of strength. But from a design point of view, uh, the folks who wrote the standard figured, well, this is actually quite easy to implement. It works really well, and it works really well in practice. And so uh, that's why we have this two and a half. So, yeah, that's good. You know, if I have, um, you know, some restraint here, and so I know that, well, this restraint has to have two and a half percent um, this NCR in order to be, um, you know, uh, able to resist uh, this buckling load. And, you know, similarly, if we come down to this, uh, you know, N star, so this is just some arbitrary N star, um, this alpha, the stiffness, well, instead of thinking of the stiffness, think about the strength of this little spring has to be 2.5%, so 0 0.0025 of N star. Well, that's what we do if we have just uh, one restraint. But what happens if we have multiple restraints over a, um, uh, a given column length? So, you know, what do we do with these multiple restraints? So, if we have more, strengths, uh, more restraints than are required, so say that you only need uh, a single restraint, but you have multiple, say you've got three uh loads of uh, three points of restraint. How do you do that? Well, we've sort of drawn out that example just right here, where, you know, for, you know, just for the, the sake of the example, say that we have this uh, applied load N star, and um, we only need a restraint at one location. So, 
you know, we can, the, the section has a large enough capacity where for an unbraced length, uh, L over two, uh, we would meet it. And again, this is just a, a cooked up example, just something to sort of uh, illustrate this point. So we only need one restraint, and that restraint only needs to be able to take 0 0.0025 times n star, but we've got three of them here. So what we do is we're allowed to divide out the force um, in the restraint by all three, and then you can see that's what we've done here. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, this might happen if you have a, say you've got a warehouse building and it's the, the external um, column, you know, you might have a series of uh, girts uh, running along there in order to um, secure the cladding for the, the building. And so you might, you know, only be counting on one in your design, uh, but if you have these others, that means that you might be able to make this a, um, a, a somewhat lighter section, somewhat smaller. So the uh, other um, sort of uh, case which we run into a lot is that we have, you know, not multiple restraints over one element, but uh, one restraint connecting multiple elements. So, you know, if you have just this line of uh, restraints here, what do we do and how do we determine the, um, uh, the restraint force here, this R A of B? Well, uh, what the standard says we can do is... Well, we, it, we know we have to take 2.5% of this column. So was, let's say that column AB is the one it's restraining. Uh, we have to take 2.5% of that N star. And then we take 1.25% um, of all of the other adjacent columns. And really this is, remember what this is doing, it's restraining, it's stopping uh, this lateral movement at this point. Um, it's trying to do this and make sure that this delta equals zero. And so, um, you know, you take half the force, uh, half the, the restraint force in each of these other columns. And so for the case here, you know, we've got a of a column A, B. So just say column A, B, just to give it a, a little bit of a, a denoting uh, principle, uh, point here. And then we have one, two, three, four, other columns that it is also trying to restrain, uh, trying to keep this buckled shape uh, down to zero at this point. Uh, and so we only take half the force, half the restraint force out of those. And then we have this maximum of um, 0.1 uh, times n star. So that limit of 0.1 times n star is really, uh, it comes from a statistical analysis that was done uh, when these provisions were written which really should have said that, you know, it's unlikely that you'll get more than um, seven columns all buckling in the same direction. So if they all buckled in the same direction, well, then we either have all the same compression or all the same tension uh, occurring in the brace. Uh, because we're likely to have, you know, some level of randomness, you know, the buckling going this way versus the buckling going that way, we'll start to cancel out um, the forces as you get many, many columns here. So uh, that's why we have this limit of only uh, 0.1 times n. So uh, let's take this, let's look at just a, a little example here. So uh, say we have this restraint in, uh, we're going to look at this restraint PQ. Um, that I've highlighted here in red. What's the restraint force that we need? Well, we know that we need to take the um, force in column P and we're going to, so that's going to get multiplied by 2.5%, uh, so 0 0.00025. Um, times column P, uh, and then we also have to take O, M, N, L, K, so one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to J. And again, this just goes back to the, we're, we're basically limited to this six additional columns here. So, and then it's going to be 
0 0.0125 times the force in column uh, O N M L K and J and you know just sort of put you know the the ditto marks here for each of these and so that's going to end up being uh, so restraint uh, well here we'll just call that uh, n star of uh, P Q restraint equals 0 0.025 uh, times n star, which is the applied load at P, times n star. And because these are all the same, we'll just uh, sort of collect these, uh, and that's going to be plus 0 0.0125 times n star times 6, and then we get n star PQ restraint equals 0 0.1 n star. Um, another thing which is I just kind of want to point out here on this uh, example is if we go back to you know some of our uh, our first requirements um, for the uh, you know our, our restraint, you know one is this two and a half percent n star. But the other one is that we need that restraint to be effectively anchored. And so what does that mean? Well, this example uh, gives uh, sort of some, some nice um, points to illuminate that on. So the restraint that's here comes all the way back to a bracing bay. And so you can see how uh, if this element wanted to uh, kick out here, so we've got this buckled shape. Well, you know, say it's wanting to push there, so we have this uh, tension force, uh, which is going to uh, get chased all the way back, and then, you know, we can bring it down uh, to the uh, to the ground here in this bracing bay uh, until that we can again resist that with uh, some shear force at the base. If we didn't have this bracing bay on either side. Well, um, then, you know, we're, we're having to anchor this uh, restraint force on really just a column. Um, and so that's not very effective restraint. It's like having, you know, if we have a, uh, a column here, and I'm trying to restrain it. It's like it's trying to, you know, go along with the restraint. It's not really doing anything. It doesn't have any, any we, there's no way to develop that stiffness. And so this is a, this is a really important thing. It often gets... Uh, uh, sort of neglected uh, in design, uh, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really important that you chase the load path through and you make sure that if you do have a, a restraint, so after you've sized it uh, for the, the load that you need, you need to make sure that you can take that restraint force and bring it down into the ground. Um, and so, uh, well, that's that looks at some parallel uh, restraint conditions, uh, but you know, and this is you know, what about? Uh, so we've we've kind of been talking about these uh, sort of idealized, you know, restraints. It's kind of in, uh, you know, we're looking individual columns. We're looking uh, really with you know either um, single columns or or even when we do these multiple ones. But we're we're using relatively idealized boundary conditions. So what do we do if we have restraints in frames? And uh, you know why are we looking at this? Well, it's because uh, that's where a lot of compression members uh, end up being located. So uh, they're either going to be in frames or in trusses. For um, in this lecture, we're going to we're going to focus on frames. Uh, the requirements for trusses are are similar, but they'll be in the um, in the New Zealand. Uh, and this 3404 section, which is looking at triangulated members. But as I say, we're going to put that aside for now, uh, and really we're just only going to focus on frames in this video. And so our, um, our frames, really what we do, so I'll say I've, I've got a little example here. 
um, the whole thing we're trying to get out of this is this LE factor because um, our, our, our compression uh, member is really just our effective length between points of effective restraint. And so, um, you know, whether it's fixed or it's pinned or somewhere in between is how we modify this case of E. And so the uh, little frame I have drawn here, it's got uh, the columns have a um, some stiffness, uh, you know, E times I of column one, I of column for level two, uh, I for the beam of level one, I for beam of level two, and we've got these two different lengths of columns. Um, they could be equal, but you know, this is the uh, this is sort of the most general case, and we've got the length of the beam. So what we want to do is for an individual member, we really want to find the rotation. So this uh, a gamma here, you can think about this as a rotation. Um, and so that rotation, we want to determine what's it going to be for the uh, top of the column and for the bottom of the column and we'll do it with this formula here where we you know for each of the so if we look at the top so say we're looking at gamma at the top well we want to sum up what our um, ratio of the i of the column divided by l of the column is for each column coming into this joint so we would have in this case um, uh, I column 2 over L column 2 plus I column 1 over L column 1 uh, will be the, uh, the um, numerator up here. The denominator, we will use beta E times um, the moment of inertia of the beam over the length of the beam. And this beta E factor uh, is really depends upon the end condition uh, at the other end of the beam, and it's uh, uh, really just coming straight out of a, uh, a figure, oh sorry, a table um, in the standard. And so if we just look at that, uh, we've, I think we've just come right by it, uh, you can see that it's uh, dependent upon you know, the fixity at the far end of the beam, whether it's pinned, whether it's rigidly connected to the column, or uh, fixed. And so the difference between fixed and rigidly connected, uh, your rigidly connected would be if you have, say, a, uh, a moment resisting frame. Uh, fixed would be, you know, this is uh, your beam is buried into concrete, um, and very, very rigid and, and not going to, to move at all. And then pinned is what we would use if we have a uh, you know, simple connection. So, you know, we wouldn't have our flanges attached, for, for example. Um, and you can see that you have slightly different B of E factor, uh, beta E factors, whether uh, you have a system which is braced against side sway or if you have one which is allowed uh, to sway sideways. So um, that's what we, you know, that's our, our beta E. So you know, what do we do is we first will determine what this uh, gamma factor is uh, for each end of the member. And then as we, uh, once we do that, uh, we'll determine what our effective length factor, case of E, is um, for our two, uh, well, for our, uh, our element based upon whether it's in a brace system or a sway system. And what we do is we use the figures um, in NZS3404, um, so it's figure 4.8.3.3, and you can see this one's for sway members, uh, this is for brace members, uh, what we do is we find the stiff, we use the, um, that gamma uh, at one end, um, and we use the gamma at another, and we just find out where we land within this chart, and then we can just linearly interpolate between our case of E factors here. So you can see this 0.8 factor, uh, that's basically a gamma of 1.2 and 1.2 on either ends. Um, and so yeah, that's uh, that's uh, sort of all we would be uh, be doing. It's fairly straightforward there, and you can see where if we have a uh, a sway system, um, again similarly done, all again with all of the sway, our ke factors are always going to be greater than one, and our brace factors, uh, the ke is always going to be uh, less than one, uh, just because of 
the uh, additional um, you know moment which uh, gets generated from the case of E, uh, thus reducing the Euler buckling load. Um, so coming back, uh, we've looked at you know how do we how do we determine uh, an element which is sort of we've got the the joints, but what do we do for say our example column here, our lambda at the bottom? So um, we the standard uh, provides um, really a, uh, a sort of a, a more realistic base upon you know what we would so if, if we think about this gamma as a rotation uh, for a pin base well in theory we can you have infinite rotation for a fixed base we have in theory zero rotation um, but you know there's we're, we're dealing with real structures and real connections so uh, we need to have something which uh, allows us to to get close to this theory but account for uh, the realisms in design and so for a, a nominally pin based um, we use a gamma of 10 and so you know you determine for this example you determine your gamma at the top based upon the stiffness ratio of the frame the elements framing into this joint and the gamma at the bottom uh, we would use uh, well this is a fixed one uh, so we would use this uh, gamma equals 0 0.6 uh, for our fixed connections. So we're that's almost uh, finished up with what we want to look at for um, restraints, except for one last thing, just sort of talking about restraint detailing. Um, so during buckling, that sort of makes sense, right? You know, both flanges are going to want to uh, kick out and buckle out. And so um, that means that both flanges are critical flanges. And so, you know, I've got the little uh, buckling drawing here. So in red, you can kind of, uh, you can sort of see the, the buckled shape. And then if we take a section there, well, obviously uh, the black is the, uh, the unbuckled portion. And you can see the red. And you say if this is sort of at mid-height, it wants to move out. So in order for this restraint to be effective, well, we actually need to restrain both flanges, and that's kind of what I've, I've drawn here. So let's highlight the restraint um, just in red, just to make it uh, show up a little bit clearer. Um, but you can see, you know, say we have this uh, strut coming in, well, we need some plate or, or some ability to attach to both flanges uh, to keep it from moving sideways. If we didn't do that, and say we only brought this restraint right to the middle, uh, well then our element, well it won't move in the middle, but now it is actually uh, quite susceptible to a, a torsional buckling mode. And so that's just sort of our, our last little uh, comments, just sort of again bringing back uh, much the same as we looked at with the portal frame example, that uh, the detailing on this uh, really does matter, uh, and we have to make sure that we bring all of these elements back uh, to a um, to to a good point of of, um, of anchorage, and we have to make sure that when we connect them up, uh, we've also connected them in a way that uh, stops both flanges from moving. So, um, you know, that's just a, should be a sort of you know nice uh, quick uh, intro into uh, you know restraints for compression members. Uh, the big one here is that you know they need a a certain uh, strength. Uh, this two and a half percent, and that um, you know we're uh, then going to use these uh, in order to make sure that we can uh, we can you know, reduce our effective length and, and increase our critical buckling strength. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to say thanks for watching.